Alrighty, I'm going to have a, another couple lectures in this chapter, as, as implied by this brain tour part one. There will be a brain tour part one and a brain tour part two. Um, and, and as you'll see at the end of this, there's actually a sense to the to the point in which we split between part one and point part two. But I'll highlight that at the end of this lecture. Um, those will probably be those will be the last two lectures in chapter three, this one and the next one. So cool. Let's jump in. So there's our little tour bus sightseeing Toronto, um, except of course we're not going to be sightseeing Toronto. My goal here is to get you guys um, to the point where you're amateur neuroscientists. Um, in fact, let me use this as a point to make a distinction that you'll see throughout uh, some of these slides, a distinction between neuroscience and neuropsychology. We're going to touch on a bit of both here. Neuroscience generally uh, refers to the notion of whatever work you're doing, you connect it to the brain. Um, and so a cognitive neuroscientist, for example, is, is studying cognitive processes, but very much connecting them to brain tissues involved. A developmental neuroscientist is, is studying developmental issues, but tying them to the brain, etc. Neuropsychology was and still is to some extent, although not as strongly as it was, uh, it's more of an approach to learning about the brain. And specifically, neuropsychologists often used patient populations. That is, there would be populations who, for whatever reason, suffered damage to their brain um, in, in some way. Um, so, for example, World War II uh, is as horrible as it is and was. Uh, resulted in a lot of gunshots to the head. Um, not nice, of course, obviously, uh, but if you're the neuropsychologist, what that means is you have a bunch of patients who have pretty specific lesions to parts of their brain, and quite often these patients survive, uh, and that allows you to understand, to some extent, what that part of the brain was important for, because you see this person unable to do something uh, because of they don't have that part of the brain, right? Uh, and so that was the sort of neuropsychology approach, looking at people who had various forms of brain damage and learning about the brain from them. And that used to be the way we learned a lot about the human brain. Uh, animal brains, we were of course dissecting and such, uh, doing these so-called ablation studies, so we were caught specifically causing damage to animals' brains. Um, but neuropsychology is kind of the closest we could come to that with humans. Now, of course, as we get a lot of imaging devices, fMRIs and, and all that kind of stuff, we can now study the human brain in ways that we couldn't, um, you know, before even the 2000s very well. Uh, and, and so neuroscience has embraced these new methods a lot more and, and neuropsychology is still not as strong or, or is no longer as powerful a force in brain learning as it was but it's still there. And also some of the things we've learned about the brain, we've learned through neuropsychology studies, and I'll be highlighting some of those here. So cool that we have that distinction. And so what I'm gonna do is just kind of go through some of the, the brain stuff. We're gonna get up to the cortical areas uh, pretty quickly, and it is going to be kind of like a fast-paced tour. Like you're sitting on the top of a double-decker bus, and I'm just saying, oh, to your right, there's this issue, and let's talk about that. Uh, and to your left, there's this issue, and let's talk about that. These are all brain-related issues, and then eventually brain-related um, geography. What do certain parts of the brain do? Cool, let's jump in. Okay, so first of all, um, just to get this sort of um, distinction here between the cortical areas, which are these curved areas here, uh, and the, the midbrain areas, which are, you know, in the middle of the brain. So this is the much more ancient parts. This is where the limbic system and a lot of the other um, core parts, you've learned about the cerebellum, how that orchestrates our movements or helps make us uh, pretty fluid with our movements and such. Um, the hypothalamus is here, which directs our attention. Uh, you, of course, you know the amygdala and the thalamus are, are, are there as well. Uh, I'm sorry, the thalamus directs your attention. Um, these are parts that, yeah, make sure we're getting enough oxygen and, and do all sorts of things that keep us alive. The cortical issues are where the higher level cognitive processes um, occur. And, you know, one of the things we'll, we'll talk about is you know, why does it look like this? And notice that it's, you know, very, um, very bent up. Why is that? Well, um, our brain isn't encased in the skull, 
right? We have this skull, and in fact, the skull is pretty heavy. It's a heavy bit of bone on the very top of this sort of scrawny neck we have. Uh, and, and we only want these heads to get so big. Uh, for some reason, well, one reason is childbirth, right? This head has to go through the ovarian tube. So we, we don't want we don't want humans to have too big a heads. If their heads get too big, childbirth will become extremely dangerous indeed. Um, and it's heavy. Uh, and so our skull is sort of a certain size. However, brain tissue, all these neurons, the more we can pack in there, the more processing power we have. And so what the brain has done over time is it, tries, it has tried to stuff more and more brain into a given space of the skull. And so you know, just as a demonstration, here's a nice little thing my, uh, my I think my grandson did for me. Hey, isn't that nice? So look at look at this and, and look how much space this takes up right now, right? But if we do this, I'm gonna mess up it. You know what? I'm not gonna use that picture. <laughs> I'm going to use a piece of just to this piece of paper. I don't want to muck up his picture. So let me do this. You know, if you do that, you can take that same amount of paper and put it in a much smaller area. So you can take a surface area and it's the surface um, that's critical here. You can take a larger surface area and put it in a smaller space. And so the brain has started folding in on itself in that way. And that's why it has the kind of look that it has. Um, and that leads us to talk about things like fissures and sulci um, and all that that kind of define uh, the brain. And in fact, a lot of these wrinkles, these, these um, fissures and the sulci and stuff um, are pretty standard uh, across different brains. Every brain's a little different, but some of these are pretty standard and we sometimes use certain ones to define certain parts of the brain uh, where we consider them starting and stopping. And you'll see that uh, in just a moment, okay? So that's the cortical issue. Uh, it's doing all our high level thinking and stuff while the midbrain areas are, are worrying about basic performance and survival, etc. Lower level, more primitive functions. Okay, so we can we can think of the brain as split in, in, in those sorts of ways. Of course, the cortex is the more recently evolved. And in humans, especially this area, which is the prefrontal cortex, we have got more of that than, than any uh, being relative to our size. You know, a whale would have more cortex, but relative to the size of our body, we have a lot of prefrontal cortex. Uh, and again, that's why we're able to do things in a sort of engineering or creative sense that we don't see other animals doing uh, because we can do all this high level planning and thinking. Cool. All right. So if we think about the cortex, which is mostly what we're going to focus on here, and, and notice now you kind of see what I say, that there is a sulci that runs here and that is kind of used to define the temporal lobe, the green one. So by the way, this picture, it's kind of gross looking, right? Because the brain looks slimy. Um, I do that on purpose because it always reminds me of this funny story I heard that I've always wanted to do, but but haven't gotten around to. And, and now with COVID, it's trickier. But you can look, go online and you can find a brain mold. So like a jello mold that, that is the size and shape of a brain. And then you can literally put jello in it. And in fact, there is a recipe uh, of, a, of a sort of jello that you can create and put in it that ends up looking very brain-like. So you can create this, this thing that, that looks like a brain. And if you touch it, kind of has the, the feeling of a brain. And I've heard of, a, of some instructors who bring one of these to class. And they let people touch. They say, "Hey, this is a brain," and they let people touch it. And everyone's like, "Ooh, wow, that's I can't. I'm amazing." And then the instructor at some point says, "Yeah, and you know what else? You don't know about brains. They're delicious." And he bites right into it and eats it, which disgusts the whole crowd. Um, I want to do that badly. <laughs> I haven't done that yet. Um, but you can go out and do that if you want. You can get the brain mold and the, and the jello recipe. So this always reminds me of that because it looks kind of, plus the colors are horrible that they've picked. But, you know, do notice that there's certain sulci and fissures here um, that kind of define the lines between these lobes. Um, we have the cerebellum sitting back here. You, you've the, the book talked quite a bit about the cerebellum, so I'm not going to talk about that too much, uh, other than it refines movements and, and, and really allows us to, to behave in smooth ways um, as we interact with the world. But we're going to focus on these four lobes. And in fact, today, we're going to focus on these three 
lobes. And what I want you to understand about the brain as we go through it is these three lobes are primarily about input to the brain, processing the world, um, you know, getting a sense of what's out there, uh, what it looks like, what it sounds like, where it is, um, what it what it feels like. Um, yeah. Uh, and so these are about input to the brain. The frontal lobe is more about output. Uh, it's more about performing action on the world. So, you know, you can think of the brain as taking a bunch of input in, thinking about the input and its goals and its long-term, you know, desires and all this kind of stuff, and then deciding what is the appropriate action in this context. And so these are the parts that get the input and the frontal lobe is the part that um, combines that with our goals and aspirations and ultimately guides our output. Okay, so we're gonna start by talking about the input side. Next lecture, I'll focus on the output side. All right, couple of things before we get into those specific areas. Um, almost every cortical area we'll talk about, within that area, we, we talk about primary cortex versus association cortex. And I really want you to get the, this, this distinction and you know how it makes sense. So I'll just say this first of all, Primary cortex is where the direct sensory information comes in. We'll, we'll save the motor thing. I'll explain that next lecture. Um, but like if you're seeing something, where does that, where does vision start? You know, what's the part of the brain that senses the raw input? Um, that's the primary cortex. So we'll talk about primary auditory cortex and primary visual cortex, as you'll see. Um, but then there's the part that makes sense out of what's out there. And it does so by connecting it with memory and previous experience. So this all sounds kind of weird, but an example I think makes a lot of sense. So if I asked you very quickly just to read what that said, I suspect any of you guys could very easily say it says the cat in the hat. Okay, the cat in the hat, cool. Now here's the sort of weird thing I want you to kind of um, see about this. Every H and every A are in fact the exact same symbol in the real world. I literally copy and pasted that same odd looking thing. Sometimes you see it as an H. Sometimes you see it as an A. It's not the raw input. The raw input is the same. So in terms of the primary cortex, what it receives is the exact same. Like, I mean, look at this example, of course, you know, with these two. What it receives is the exact same. So why do you see this as H-A-T? Well, because of the context in which it occurs. You've seen words before, and yes, this could literally be the word Thai, like in Taekwondo or something like that. We have seen that, and you may sort of see this as Thai, except when you start seeing this, Thai, so this is clearly cat, and once this is cat, then this becomes the, right? The cat, because the Thai cat, I mean, maybe it's a new kind of action figure. Watch out, watch Saturday mornings at 10 while Thai cat takes on, I don't know, could be. Um, but not only do we know the cat, but we know this phrase, the cat in the hat. And as the brain starts to process this information, it takes the primary input, but it starts interpreting it. It starts making sense out of that. And it does that by connecting it with previous experience. So once it sees the cat in, the brain is already now ready for the hat. That's how this often follows in terms of our memory. And there we got the, and there we got hat. Uh, and so critical point being, we have the primary cortex where the information originally comes, and then we have areas around that that figure out what it means. You know, what, what is that thing that I'm looking about? How is it relevant to me? And it, it recognizes, that's a right way to say it. It recognizes what it's seeing based on what it's seen before and what it knows about the world. If this is still a little vague, it'll become clearer as we talk about this distinction um, in the context of the specific lobes. But you'll hear me talk about primary versus association cortex. Another thing that will come up as we go through the brain stuff uh, is this weird notion of what we're going to call contralateral organization. In many cases, the left side of our brain is processed by the, sorry, the left side of our body or the left side of space 
is processed by the right side of our brain and vice versa. The right side of our body and the right side of space is processed by the left side of our brain. Like literally for every eyeball, for example, if you imagine an eyeball and you, and you imagine two halves, a left half and a right half of each eyeball, the left half of each eyeball goes to the right half of the brain. Whatever lands there goes to the right half of the brain. And the right half of each eyeball, whatever lands there goes to the left half of the brain. So there's this crossing over that happens. The textbook kind of talks about it and, and says, oh, this is because whatever. I read that and went, I don't understand why that follows. And, and to be perfectly honest with you, I have never heard a very good description of why the brain is like this. Uh, but it is, and you're going to see examples of that. So again, I'll point these out as we go through, um, just kind of letting you know that this is, an, this is a, a characteristic of the brain. I just realized I still have my earbuds in. I don't know why. Anyway, <laughs> I'm taking them out. There, I don't need those. Huh. I feel free. It's almost like we're cyborgs nowadays. Eh? We have these things stuck in our ears all the time. Okay. <sighs> Sorry, little diversion there. Uh, and, and now one more of these, and then we'll start our real tour of the brain. And this is the, the issue of lateralization of function. So I, I always have to use this to mention uh, one of my favorite bands, a Canadian band called Rush. One of my favorite albums is called Hemispheres. It is an example of how this issue has reached the general public. Um, You've, you've heard of this thing, are you left-brained or are you right-brained? In fact, you can go online and you can do quizzes or whatever, little questionnaires, and they will tell you whether you're left-brained or right-brained. And we always think of people who are left-brained as being more creative, cre creative, thank you, um, musical, you know, artistic, um, seeing the big picture kind of thing, whereas people who are more right-brained, sorry, that was people who was more right-brained creative, artistic. People who are more left-brained, we see as more analytical, sort of problem-solving, detail-oriented, um, et cetera, that kind of thing. And so people will say, well, which are you? So the, the first point to make here is, in a way, that's a silly thing to ask because the brain has this connection, the corpus callosum, uh, a set of nerve fibers that connect the left and the right, and the left and the right communicate really, really well uh, and very, very quickly. So in fact, even though, for example, um, you know, a certain stimulus that occurs on the left may be processed initially by the right, it shares that information almost immediately with the left. Uh, and so if that corpus callosum is intact, then, um, you know, it really is one brain effectively. If that's cut, there are situations where that's cut. Well, we can talk about that. And I think we do. Um, split brain studies. Check that out. If, uh, if I don't talk about it, check it out. It's really cool. Um, look on YouTube or something like that. So at any rate, there is some notion to lateralization. So when we talk about hemispheres and remember, you know, I, in a picture like this, it looks like um, there's four hemispheres. Well, there are four hemispheres, but there's really eight hemispheres um, because there's two halves of the brain. This may be a time, this may be a time when we, we're gonna go back, heck, let's do it. Sorry to introduce you to the mess that is my life. Well, not my life, my browser. <laughs> let's go back to the 3D brain and let's just make this, this point here because this is a really um, uh, a, a good, sort of example of how you can use this tool. And let me just highlight again, by the way, this 3D brain is, is something as you go through this chapter that can be uh, really useful. Um, skip intro. Okay, I've had this happen to me once before. It's building the brain super slowly, and I don't know why it does it super slowly sometimes, but here it's, it's coming along. There we have midbrain. Okay, so you have a really good example of midbrain, and we're gonna start slapping cortical structures on. Oh, still. It's kind of cool to watch it built this way, right? Because this may be how the brain evolved. There we go. There's a cortical structure. That's one hemisphere. And soon it will add the other hemisphere. Um, but this is a great time to look at it. So, you know, literally this is, there we go. So we have two. So if you look at the brain from the front or from the top or back, for that matter, if you want to spin it right over, um, you see there is this split in between. But there's also this thing right there, if I can get it the corpus callosum right here. Um, and, and this is like a band. Think of this as a band that cuts right across. This isn't like a snake going from here to there. It's going from the left side, so there you go, to the right side. And it's connecting those two hemispheres. But if you think of any specific hemisphere, 
it does have those four lobes. Let me see if I have something that just breaks down the lobes here. Um, we have the whole, okay, so we can look at them one at a time. So we have the frontal lobe, but again, there's two frontal lobes, right? And notice, by the way, it's not perfectly symmetrical, which is kind of cool. Um, occipital lobe, we'll talk about it, the back of the brain. Notice again, technically, there's two. Parietal lobe, top of the brain. And notice that it only goes so far down, right? Because we had the occipital back here, we had the frontal over there, so that means we have left the temporal, which is down here. Okay, so cool. So don't forget about that, that uh, brain mapping thing. That's a really cool way to kind of um, come back, and maybe we'll come back to that now and then. Um, so, you know, it, there, are, there are two occipital lobes, there are two temporal lobes, there are two parietal lobes, one on the left, one on the right. And sometimes when we look at what these are doing, the ones on the left do something different than the ones on the right. Um, and so there is a sense that sometimes the left part of the brain is different than the right, the right part of the brain. Um, it doesn't mean that it makes sense that people are left or right brained. Again, it's often overblown. Uh, in, in this rush, Thing, they talk about um, sort of the emotional part versus the intellectual part and there's a battle and in this case um, and it's um, done in terms of Greek gods between Dionysus so he's the lover of wine and, and, and song and all that and Apollo who's the intellectual um, so Dionysus and Apollo right left brained um, so we often make a lot out of this and it's is often overblown but there's a certain amount of accuracy to it too and so we'll talk about that okay so that all of this down let's just jump in there there's the brain facts just to remind you um, of you know that that 3d thing you could use let's start with the occipital lobe the occipital lobe and lower parts of the temporal lobes but let's take the occipital lobe right at the back of the brain here this is where the visual signal that starts at your eyes and then crosses at the optic chiasm ends up coming back to your to your uh, occipital lobes at the back. They process visual input and make sense of it. That's that's what they do. Again, there is the um, what can we do this? There there is the um, let me see if the occipital will break down this way. Okay, it does sort of. So it shows you the primary. So look at this. This is the primary. Um, there, there's a way to split these. Um, I think is it this? That's my nasty. There's a nasty tool you can use. Oh, I don't know what that is. Oh, this is an annotation tool. I don't want the annotation tool. There's a there's a tool to do actual. Um, uh, never mind. Add whatever. There's a tool to, <laughs> to to actually cut the brain so you can get rid of parts of it. Uh, but anyway you see the primary cortex is right in the in the inside there so this is where the raw visual input comes in to the brain um, and then the rest of the occipital lobe boom is about interpreting what that input is that's the association cortex okay so here is hopefully this might help you understand this a little better if that primary part is damaged, that part just inside the lobes, if there's damage to that, you end up with something called a scotoma. What's a scotoma? What, it's, it's basically a black spot on your vision. And so wherever you look, there's this black spot that you feel like you can see nothing there, almost like you were wearing glasses and somebody stuck you know, a sticker right there so that wherever that goes, I get this just black spot. I can't see anything um, through it. Um, that's what happens when the primary visual thing. So it's like your primary vision is affected. But here's what happens when, excuse me, when the association cortex is affected. Uh, and this is kind of cool. So let me take this as a moment to introduce you to Oliver Sacks, one of the most famous neuropsychologists uh, that ever was. There's been a number of movies uh, based on, on his work. Um, the Awakenings would be one example. Um, he, I recommend this book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. It's a bunch of short stories about people who have had damage to various parts of their brain and the kind of odd behaviors they showed and what that says about the brain. So it's kind of, if, if you're interested in the brain, it's a kind of interesting, fun read. He's a very good writer um, and, and you learn a lot. 
And so some of my examples will come from his work and others, including this one. So the man who mistook his wife for a hat. What the heck is that about? Well, that title comes from the fact that um, Sachs had, there was an interview uh, between an interview. No, what am I talking about? So Sachs is a doctor, neuropsychologist. Um, he had this gentleman and his wife in his office. And this gentleman has a specific problem, which is called visual agnosia. I'll tell you about it in just a moment. Uh, but after they had had their little chat and it was all over, um, this gentleman stood up to leave. And a habit of his was, as he left, was to, to take his hat and put it on his head. Um, it was a, He was a hat-wearing kind of guy. Uh, but as he went to do this, he reached out for his, well, he grabbed his wife's head is what he did. He grabbed his wife's head as though he were going to grab it and put it on his head. And as soon as he grabbed his head, he was like, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. But Oliver thought that was kind of interesting. He mistook his wife for a hat. What does this reflect? It reflects something called visual agnosia. So this guy had damage um, to part of the association cortex in his occipital lobe. And what that can lead to is something called visual agnosia. And what that is, is this person still has perfectly fine vision. They can see things perfectly well, but they can't always understand what they're seeing. So for example, I should have had my favorite prop here, uh, but I don't. My favorite prop is a glove. I'm gonna have to use an invisible glove, okay? So for somebody like this, this is a classic sort of example. You could hold up this glove, um, if you, by the way, allowed them to touch it or, or do anything with it, they'll probably recognize it. But if they can only see it, you're only letting them see it. Uh, and if you say to this person, what is this? They will look at it and they will be able to tell you a lot about it. So let's say, okay, it's, it's blue. It's made of a soft fabric. It's got all of these little sort of pouches, five of these little pouches. And you're like, yep, yeah, right. Okay, good. So, so what is it? Uh, then one of the one of the examples or one of the answers one person gave is maybe it's like some sort of purse for holding coins of different sizes. You could have five different kinds of coins in this one purse. Kind of cool, um, but no, obviously that's not what it is, right? Uh, and so what the problem this person is having is not a visual problem. It's a recognition problem. What is it I'm seeing? And that's what the association cortex does for us. It helps us recognize what it is we're seeing, hearing. You'll, you'll see some other examples. Uh, and so agnosia is a lack of knowledge. That's what that word means. Uh, and visual agnosia is a lack of knowledge about things you're seeing visually. Uh, and so that's what association cortex does in vision. You'll see it do that sort of function in other parts. And, and as you saw, you know, most of the brain is recognizing what we're seeing. Only a small part of it is actually about seeing what you're seeing. That's the occipital lobe. Temporal lobe. Same kind of idea, except it's devoted to audition. Now, um, there's the primary, so just like the just like the primary visual was kind of inside the brain, so it's also true with primary auditory cortex. So the primary auditory cortex is, you know, when there's sounds in the environment and you attend to them, that's the part of your brain that and that those sounds end up sort of coming to. Uh, and again, it's sort of tucked under, uh, so you don't see the primary part very well. Uh, and damage to this leads to hearing problems. So let's, you know, let's take the time and just do this since we have it right here. Let's look at the temporal lobe. Let's look at primary. Wow, see, look at that. It's kind of tucked away in there somewhere under one of those folds or whatever. Um, so it is, it is cortex, but it's really tucked away and it's kind of small. And the rest of that then is association cortex. Um, all of this stuff. Okay. So making sense of what we're hearing, what is that, that we're hearing? There's a special part of this, by the way, called Wernicke's area. Um, and Wernicke's area is only on the left. Notice that. Um, and, and it sits right here. And this is going to be specifically about understanding language. It's the counterpart to Broca's area, which would be producing language. This is receiving it. And so this is part of what we're hearing. And in fact, it's part that humans have really prioritized, right? Because we use language so heavily, we have a whole chunk of cortex that's just about 
understanding the language. So if we go back to just the, the cortex as a, as a whole, they've broken this out. So the Wernicke's they've got kind of back here a little bit, uh, and that's for language. And then for the rest of this, this is sound, sound, you know, non-language kinds of sounds. Okay. So let's jump back into here then. So this primary cor cortex hidden from view, uh, but if you have damage to that, you, there's just things you can't hear. Okay, kind of like a scotoma, but an auditory version. Now, what about damage to the auditory association cortex? This is where we see these first hints of lateralization, as I've already highlighted to you. In the left, we have um, uh, Wernicke's area. And if there's damage to that, then patients have this trouble comprehending, understanding the speech they're hearing. They can hear the words, but they can't understand what they mean. Uh, so they can repeat words back to you, by the way. They can hear the words perfectly fine. They just can't understand what they mean. Um, whereas damage to the right affects the patient's ability to perceive non-speech sounds, things like rhythm in music, um, you know, various other regularities of sound. It looks like the right, this is why we're starting to see, right? right? Analytic versus creative. Language seems like an analytic kind of thing, whereas rhythm of music and stuff seems to be more creative. Uh, you know, imagine if you're into hip hop, this is a huge part of hip hop is the rhythmicity of, of how words are said, the prosody of the language that's being used, all the beats being used in the background. You know, that's a very right brain processing kind of thing. So the right brain is focused on that, the left brain is much more focused on language uh, in the temporal lobe. Kind of cool. So a little bit of that laterality we've been talking about. Let's continue our tour. The parietal lobe, right across the top of the head. So let's talk about this and let's look at it in a second. Um, this is about the body. So I, I always need to sort of start by making us kind of realize the challenge that we have here. Um, we are this, we're, if, if we live somewhere, we live in our brain and our brain is encased in skull and that's all encased in this body. And then outside the body is this world. The body is like our craft, our vehicle for moving around the world. If we're gonna move around the world, we have to have a good sense of what's out there, where it is, and we also have to have a good sense of where our body is, especially if we have to negotiate tight kind of things. So for example, the example I used to use in my classroom is I used to walk between the rows of chairs. Uh, and there's not a lot of room there and the students had bags laying down and computers and stuff. And so in order to be able to walk between those students, which seems horrible in a COVID world, what, you were that close? Yes, we used to get that close. Um, in order to walk between all those students, you don't just have to know where all that stuff is in the world. You also have to know where your body is. Uh, where in order to lift your foot enough, for example, to go up that step or whatnot, you need to know where it is. It's something called proprioception. We'll get to it. Um, but this is what the parietal lobe does. Those sort of two things. Where are things in the world and where is my body? And if I know those two things, I can move my body through the world without banging into stuff all the time. Okay, so let's kind of go through this a little bit. Primary sensory cortex is perception of the body. If, if you actually um, lose some of that, and we're gonna talk about this more actually in the next lecture when I introduce you to the sensory strip and the motor strip. And so the sensory strip will be the primary cortex. It's where all sensations come from our body. And if I had damage to a specific part of it, I might have a numbness. So the part, the part of my uh, sensory cortex that, that gets input from my hand, for example, if that was all damaged, I wouldn't feel anything touching my hand. It's like it wouldn't even have, wouldn't register on my brain. I wouldn't feel it. Um, so again, primary vision lets you see, primary audition lets you hear, primary uh, parietal is where you sense your body. When we get into the association cortex, this is where things are, are complicated and we don't fully understand things yet, but the left part appears to keep track of where our bodies are. So this is kind of a funny thing. And I always, I always do this with students, this notion of proprioception. Like if you take a moment right now and sit there, sit up straight. And if I ask you right now, what's your right big toe doing? Check in on your right big toe. 
you know, this is almost like that mindfulness stuff with the relaxation training, right? But you can kind of bring your mind to your right, left, right, left, toe, right, big toe, and you can kind of pay attention to where it is. And, and you can probably feel, um, if you're sitting down, like pressure on your butt, you can feel the actual chair underneath your butt. If you're, if you have a backrest, you can probably feel things across your back. If you have one body part sitting on another, like an arm on your leg, if you pay attention, you can feel your arm touching your leg. You can kind of feel your body from the inside. Um, in fact, here's another Oliver Sacks one for you that I always like this story. So there's this story of a woman who has problems with, with her um, association cortex uh, in the left of her brain. And one of the stories Oliver Sacks tells is, is um, in the hospital, they heard screaming one night and they ran into the hospital room and this woman was laying on the floor She'd fallen out of her bed um, and, and she seemed kind of horrified. And once, once they kind of got her back in bed and relaxed, um, Oliver Sacks said, so, so what happened? Like, why did, why did that happen? And she said, well, oh, kind of scary. I woke, up and I woke up at some point and my goodness, there was a leg in the bed with me. And it wasn't my leg. It was like a human leg in bed with me and it freaked me right out. And so I grabbed that sucker and I threw it out of the bed with all my strength, lifted that and threw it out of the bed. Um, and then to my horror, the rest of me followed along behind it because it was attached to me. So that's the story. So she had lost feeling any input from her leg. Even when she grabbed it sitting there in the bed, she did not feel like that was her leg because she couldn't feel her hands grabbing it. She was getting no input from the leg. It just seemed like a leg. And so she picked it up and threw it. Legs are heavy, by the way, if you if you really appreciate it, threw it out of the bed. And because the leg is heavy, it pulled the rest of her down with it. Sounds pretty crazy, right? But have you ever fallen asleep like this? You fall asleep like that? All the blood drains out of your hand, you know, drains right out. Uh, and when all the blood drains out, we can get a state like this. And maybe you wake up and you're like, ah, there's a hand in front of my eye. And, and then you want to move, but you, it, it doesn't feel like your hand. And you might physically have to grab it and lift it and drop it because you're not getting any input from it until the blood starts to come back into it. And then you, feel, you get the pins and needles and then you feel it come back. That's what it would be like to not have proprioception. We have this continual input from our body telling us where everything is. And that's what makes it feel like our body. Uh, and, and we use that to move our body in sophisticated ways. Thanks, of course, to a lot of the brain structures you've heard about uh, involved in movement as well. So that's what the left part of the parietal lower is doing. The right seems to focus on the external world. Um, people who have damage to the right side of the brain, again, neuropsychological stuff, they show this thing we call neglect. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of a funny thing. Um, do I give you examples? No, I just say it will be continued. I want to give you an example. Um, and so let's very quickly just go to like a Google thing that I've been using for your courses probably and, um, say, um, visual neglect and we'll see a bunch of, there we go. And so what is this? These are diagrams and we show the patient these models and we say, can you just draw this? And they say, sure. And this is what they draw. And notice that what they draw can, has quite a bit of detail on the right side of the image, but it's missing detail on the left. It's like they neglect the left side of space. They just don't pay attention to it anymore. Um, kind of odd. In fact, one of the stories I love about these patients is if you give them a plate full of food, they'll often eat all the food off the right side of the plate and they'll put their fork and knife down as though they're finished. If you then walk up to them and just spin the plate, then they finish the rest of their food. So it's not like they weren't hungry. They just kind of didn't see that that food was there, not because they have a visual problem, just because for some reason it's hard for them to pay attention to that side of space. Uh, here's another example, by the way, this is a, a task where you just ask somebody circle all the letter A's and what you will sometimes see for a neglect patient is this kind of behavior. They find them all on the right, but there's all these ones over here that they just miss. Okay. And, and they don't circle. Um, so kind of, now why is it only the left? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> 
haven't heard a good story of that, um, but it is. Uh, and so all of this just to kind of, you know, tell us this is the kind of thing the parietal lobe is doing. It's focusing on where our bodies are. It's focusing on where things are in space. And it's very important for our ability to move in space. Okay. The brain to be continued. Um, but again, let, let me stress a little bit that um, we've really talked about input so far, right? Visual input, auditory input, um, body input, so to speak. Uh, what we're going to do in the next lecture is, is now say, okay, the brain has all this input. Now what's to do with it? And that's the frontal lobe story. I'm going to bring in a little bit of also what's called the sensory strip, which will be right here. And, and actually, let me foreshadow that to get you thinking about it. Sensory strip, motor strip. <laughs> sensory strip, motor strip. They're side by side. Uh, and literally one, the one closer to the parietal is the sensory, and that's going to be their primary area. So I'm going to come back to that a little bit next lecture. And then this will be what we call primary motor cortex. It's better to talk about them together. So I'll do that in the next lecture. Okay, cool. So come on back next lecture. Our tour of the brain will continue. I will see you there. Bye-bye.